the chimpanzee is the human's closest living relative. 99% of our genes are the same. And even our behavior has more in common than scientists used to think. Every time chimpanzees were seen to do something which people used to think only humans could do, there was an immediate uh, reaction that this can't be. So what's the difference between humans and chimpanzees? And how big is that difference? I take it as a given that humans are different. Uh, you just need to look around you and look at the artifacts and the language we're talking and the television we're whatever. And um, I take it as uncontroversial that humans have some special characteristics. Is culture exclusive to humans? Or do the apes also have culture? When you think of human culture, of course you think of houses, computers, people who write operas, that kind of thing. But the average human can't construct a computer or compose an opera. So what kind of culture do apes have? Scientists are trying to answer that question. If this experiment works, it will definitely cause a sensation. The African Tropical Belt dense rainforest. For decades, humans have been encroaching on it and reducing the number of great apes. A hundred years ago, several million chimpanzees lived here. Now there are fewer than 300,000. The Kibala National Park in Uganda is one of the last refuges of the East African chimpanzee. More than 1,200 of them live here. Thibaut Gruber from the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland is on his way to the 50-strong Kanyawara group which has been accustomed to humans for more than 20 years. Gruber wants to find out if the chimpanzees' actions are genetically determined, or do they learn their behavior? That would be a first indication of culture. To answer this question, the French scientist is taking his experimental research to the jungle. Okay. We've chosen this path because we know that the chimpanzees are under a tree down there. And we also know that they build their nests on the right over there. So we assume that this must be one of the paths they use. The idea is to place the tree trunk where the chimpanzees are most likely to find it. Notre expérience installée au moment où ils vont venir. To protect the apes, Gruber has to wear a mask and gloves. This is the first stage of an experiment in which he hopes to discover how the chimpanzees react to a new challenge. He's filled a deep, narrow hole in the tree trunk with honey. The apes will not be able to reach this delicacy simply with their fingers. The comb will also fend off the insects that will try to reach the honey. The hole has to be completely covered. And now we must get out of here. The chimpanzees could appear at any moment. With their experiments, Gruber and his colleagues want to bridge the gap between pure observation in the field and laboratory experiments. Our starting point is a classical ethological one. 
Like the classical behaviorists Tin Bergen and Lawrence, we're trying to describe the animal in its natural habitat. However, you never know about the causality of observational data, what causes what. So we try to recreate the natural situation in our experiments while maintaining control of the stimuli. That way we know, when we supply a stimulus, that it can only be that specific stimulus which triggered the behavior. Experiments in the field are absolutely necessary. But nature intervenes. A horde of army ants cuts off the chimpanzee's path to the site of the experiment. Shortly afterwards, a swarm of bees discovers the honey. Researchers in the field are often thwarted by obstacles of this kind. The first to approach the trunk is 40-year-old Tongo with her child. She has spotted the honeycomb. But the bees interfere with Gruber's experiment. The researcher was expecting a different result. Was this a failure? Yes, because they didn't bring any tools. It's especially disappointing because I've known Tongo for two or three years and she's always used tools. On the other hand, we now know that the chimpanzees have discovered the location and know that there's honey here. When they return tomorrow, they'll definitely look to see if there's any more honey. Evening is approaching and the chimpanzees move on. Thibaut Gruber decides to have another go in the morning. That's field work for you. Gruber spends more than four months a year here with the chimpanzees. Here in East Africa, chimpanzees split from the human branch of the hominoidae family about seven million years ago. That is the point on which Thibaut Gruber and Klaus Zuberbühler's research is concentrating. Humans are uniquely human. Chimpanzees are uniquely chimpanzees. But we want to understand how this happened, how these species became the way they are. It's uncontested that we share an ancestor with the chimpanzees, who lived about seven million years ago. What we want to discover is what happened in those millions of years that led to the present-day human, and what led to the chimpanzees becoming the way they are. Five thirty the following morning. Let's do it. Gruber and his assistants make a second attempt. Now they can only wait. Daylight reveals that the animals are inventive. They're making pestles out of sticks. <laughs> Tongo's son, Tuba, grabs a tool.
It seems quite natural to him. It wasn't always natural to humans. It was very, very exciting when I first saw a chimpanzee picking a piece of grass and using it to fish termites from their underground nest. And it was even more exciting when I saw him reach out and pick a leafy twig and strip off the leaves, because that was the beginning of tool making. And at that time, this is 1960, we humans were defined as man, the tool maker. And so Lewis Leakey, my great mentor, uh, he sent a telegram back saying, ah, now we have to redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. Jane Goodall, the mother of chimpanzee research. Her observations in the Tanzanian Gombe Stream National Park caused a furore. But scientists are still divided as to whether the use of tools proves that chimpanzees have a culture similar to that of humans. The researchers here in Uganda hope to make a significant contribution to answering that question. En fait, ce qu'on essaie de montrer ici avec avec cette expérience, c'est que we hope to prove with this study that when you present a chimpanzee with an experimental task, he'll draw on his cultural knowledge, just as humans do, to solve the problem. Auquel il va devoir faire face durant sa durant sa vie ou même dans la journée. This one is very simple, to get honey out of a hole. Here in Kanyawara, we see that chimpanzees use sticks to reach the honey. A moment ago, we saw Special doing that. However, when we look at another group, for instance, the Sonsa group in the Budongo forest, about 180 kilometers from here, we see that the apes there use leaves. On verra que les chimpanzés utiliseront des feuilles. The field experiment with the Kabbalah chimpanzees is only the first piece of the puzzle in answering the question, do chimpanzees acquire their knowledge genetically or culturally? To complete the jigsaw, Thibaut Gruber drives 180 kilometers to the northeast to the Budongo forest. There are about 700 chimpanzees living in this nature reserve, about the size of Hamburg. The same species as in Kibala, in a very similar habitat. The forest is famous for its wealth of species, including primates, such as the red-tailed monkey, the blue monkey, and the black and white colobus. An interesting area for researchers from all over the world who have set up camp in the middle of the bush. The famous primatologist and psychologist Klaus Zuberbühler is here to see how Gruber's research is going. Professor Zuberbühler is supervising Gruber's studies at the Swiss University of Neuchâtel. There are strict rules in the camp. New arrivals have to wear a surgical mask to prevent transmitting germs when making contact with the chimpanzees. In a clearing near the camp, the honey experiment is set up again, this time under a fig tree. And it's not long before the 80 members of the Sonso group discover the tree with its ripe fruit and the experiment beneath it. Once again, they take the honeycomb, which is easy, and at first ignore the actual experiment. But then, the moment Thibaut Gruber has been waiting for. 
Although the Budongo chimpanzees live in the same conditions as the apes, 180 kilometers away, they don't think of using a stick as a tool to reach the food. The experiments show that their cultural behavior is not a direct result of the environment. The difference in behavior cannot be explained in terms of a problem present in the one group and not in the other. The animals use, to some extent, their cultural knowledge to solve a new problem. The apes appear to pass on their knowledge. Is this another indication that chimpanzees have culture? Thibault spends the evening viewing the video material he's been gathering for months. It shows that the animals in Wodongo fall back on a tried and tested chimpanzee method of soaking up honey. They chew on a bunch of leaves and make a kind of sponge out of them. This is entirely different from the chimpanzees in Kibala. The same problem, two solutions. In Wodongo, the chimpanzees soak up the honey with a leaf sponge. In Kibala, they use a stick. Why is the problem tackled so differently in Budongo? The animals didn't know how to solve the problem. Most of them tried using their fingers and then gave up. Then a few came up with an ad hoc solution. The most obvious thing to do was to use their sponge technique. Sponges are used by all groups of chimpanzees to drink water. But it was presumably a new invention to use this technique for honey extraction, to solve this specific problem. If sharing knowledge is a sign of culture, these experiments provide clear evidence of various chimpanzee cultures. And they prove that the animals use their cultural knowledge to meet new challenges. 6,000 kilometers away lies the German town of Leipzig. Christoph Bösch, one of the world's leading animal researchers, heads the primatology department at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology here. Together with some 70 other scientists, Professor Bursch is conducting research into the great apes. You'll seldom find him in his office. Most of the time, he's out in the field. Professor Bursch was one of the first to postulate that there are varying cultures among chimpanzees. He became alert to the question when he compared the ant fishing of chimpanzees in the Thai National Park in Ivory Coast with similar activities observed by Jane Goodall in Tanzania, 4,000 kilometers away. That led him to his first simple definition of culture. I think the definition minimal that everyone can accept I think the definition everyone can accept is culture is the specific behavior of a group that is learnt by the other members. Here, for instance, we see chimpanzees fishing for ants. This is the technique used by the chimpanzees in Thai National Park. They only use small sticks and poke them immediately into their mouths to eat the ants. This is characteristic of the Thai culture, which is very different from the culture of the chimpanzees in Tanzania. There they use long sticks and both hands. It's the perfect demonstration of behavior aimed at the same pickings, ants that are found all over Africa and build similar nests everywhere. Yet the chimpanzees use varying techniques, which in fact define them socially.
And Professor Bush found corroborating evidence in the way chimpanzees crack nuts. Here we see very clearly how a chimpanzee cracks a nut. He holds a stone in his right hand. The anvil is a tangle of roots he uses to crack the cola nuts. Now he places the nut on the anvil, which he's previously cleaned, hammers it, and extracts the kernel which he eats. This behavior has only been observed in southwest Ivory Coast, although the nuts and the chimpanzees are found everywhere in West and Central Africa. So it clearly shows that this is cultural behavior, in no way genetically determined, because some populations don't display this behavior at all. Bursch and his colleagues made an even more surprising discovery. Various groups within the same habitat use different tools to crack nuts. Some do it with stones, others with wooden hammers. If then neighboring chimpanzee groups apply various solutions to the same problem, are these differing cultures comparable to human cultures? The fact, for instance, that some humans eat with a knife and fork, others with chopsticks, and others with their fingers. One of Professor Bush's colleagues at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, the psychologist Michael Tomasello, says no. Tomasello heads the Department of Comparative and Developmental Psychology. He and his team examined the great apes in Leipzig Zoo's orangutan land, the world's largest enclosure of great apes. All four species live together here under one roof. Orangutans, gorillas, bonobos, and chimpanzees. The research conducted here is widely respected internationally. Professor Tomasello also speaks of culture and connection with apes. But he says, there's a vital difference from human culture. Our culture has a cumulative nature that um, new advances, everyone gets them, and they stay in place until there's another advance, and then we all get that. And so you get artifacts like a computer or a television that have a history, that they have a, they have a history where you can say, where you can show where they were simple, and then a new innovation, and they get more complex, and then another innovation, and they get more complex. And the, uh, the new people coming to these artifacts or ways of doing things, they don't, they don't have to know anything about the history. They just get the new one, okay? And they learn how to use it, and then they, maybe they do something new. Tomasello speaks of the carjack effect, meaning that human culture is built on the experiences and knowledge of our ancestors. He says that apes, on the other hand, don't have this capacity. They have to wait for individuals to make new inventions and have new ideas and can't develop the achievements of previous generations. But Christoph Bursch's most recent observations in Gabon, West Africa, contradict Tomasello's thesis. Bursch discovered that many animals in the Loango National Park are interested in the honey produced by bees in underground nests. Each species, whether elephant or honey badger, has its own method, usually brutal, of breaking open the comb. Chimpanzees, on the other hand, have developed a sophisticated technique and refined it step by step, especially with regard to nests in trees. Alors, donc, il y a eu là, par ces chimpanzees, the chimpanzees have refined their technique step by step. They've added two additional sticks to their technique of using just one little stick. 
The first stick they added is like the one back there. It's thicker and is used as a kind of pestle. And they use this pestle to break open the entrance to the hive, which is sealed with wax. As soon as they've opened the entrance, they take a second tool to reach the honey. With some populations, the hives are very deep. In that case, the chimpanzees first open the hive with a pestle and then use a second stick with a hard end to bore a hole into the interior of the hive and open the deep chambers. Then they use a third stick like the one you see here, which is much more complex, a kind of brush which soaks up the honey. So you see, the chimpanzees have arrived from a one-stick technique via a two-stick technique at a three-stick technique. There are three cumulative steps that have led to this sophisticated tool technique. Step by step, they've added one stick after another. So Christoph Bösch and Michael Tomasello, two of the most widely respected researchers, hold contradictory opinions about the similarities and differences between humans and apes. It appears that the concept of culture is the divisive issue. I found, you know, over my many years, it's now more than 50, and every time chimpanzees were seen to do something which people used to think only humans could do. There was an immediate uh, reaction that this can't be. And it seems to me that there was always a, a body of people who were desperate to prove that, well, we're different in this way and we're different in that, and culture was one of them. And we can't talk about chimpanzees having culture because humans have culture and that makes us different. What is true is that because of our language, we've been able to really go very far along the path of cultural evolution. This is the direction Klaus Zuberbühle is pursuing in Budongo. For years, he's been researching the communication and vocalization capabilities of apes. With an experiment in the field, he hopes to establish to what extent apes can communicate among themselves. He will play them recordings of their own sounds. With this experiment, I'm specifically trying to find out whether chimpanzees can use their sounds, their vocalizations, intentionally or not. That's to say, whether their calls are simply expressions of emotion or whether they use them strategically to inform other members of the group selectively. Zuberbühle is going to play the greeting calls of high-ranking companions to fig-eating chimpanzees. Scientists call this a playback test. Okay, Jax, I think we're ready. Can you play, please? Okay. okay. Individual animals in the tree react immediately to the apparent approach of high-ranking chimpanzees with what are termed food calls. The food calls are not simply a reaction to the food as such. They provide information to other members of the group who are socially important to them. Evidence of verbal communication? Of a language with semantics and grammar? The calls have meaning. There are primitive semantics. The animals are able to inform others when they consider this necessary. That is an important aspect of language. But so far we haven't found much grammar. You could say certain building blocks are there, others are missing. In that sense, of course, they don't have human language. They have ape language, to which there are certain parallels, but also certain differences. To discover more about the complexity of the ape's language, the researchers advance deeper into the bush. They hope to find out whether chimpanzees understand not only their own language, but also, to some extent, foreign languages. Okay. 
On their journey, they stumble across evidence of illegal logging. A mahogany tree has recently been chopped down. Scientists often discover such practices, another reason to press ahead quickly with their research. It's a source of food. When you chop down a tree, the animals lose another fruit tree. The second aspect is the danger of disease. People come into the forest and stay here for several days and throw their garbage around. And that also presents a danger to the animals, because they climb around in this area. So, of course, we're unhappy when we see something like this. Each year, Uganda loses 2% of its forests through logging. Destroying this provisional timber yard will hardly make any difference. I'm afraid that in 50 years, scientists like me will just feel like crying. Chimpanzees in the wild will have disappeared. By then, one or two additional populations will have been studied, and it will have been confirmed in those cases as well that there were further new behavioral patterns to be studied. It will be terribly frustrating. As a scientist, I'm seriously worried that we shall never be able to answer the question of the relationship between humans and chimpanzees honestly and fully. The researchers are under time pressure, and they still have many questions. Klaus Zuberbühle and his team hope to answer one of them now. Can chimpanzees really understand the sounds of other ape species and use them for their own purposes? Another playback test is set up. We have a group of chimpanzees back here feeding. And now we're going to play them the alarm call of the black and white colobus monkeys. The alarm calls vary depending on what colobus monkeys see. When attacked by a chimpanzee, they give a chimpanzee alarm sound. When attacked by an eagle, they give an eagle alarm sound. We're going to play that now. Jackson will play it, and I'll go back to the group and try to film their reactions. First, the chimpanzees hear the long alarm call that the colobus monkeys give when they want to warn the others that they've spotted an eagle. Jackson, Jackson. Yes, yes. Push play now, please. The chimpanzees simply ignore it. Then the second version, a shorter chimpanzee alarm call. Jackson, Jackson, can you play now? Immediately, the animals set off to take part in the exciting hunt. They must have learned the meanings of these various calls. In that sense, there are some similarities to language acquisition, which is, of course, a cultural event. However, we don't know precisely how this learning takes place, whether it's an individual experience when the chimpanzee sees the colobus with an eagle and hears the call, or if he learns it socially, for instance, by observing the mother's reaction when she encounters certain events. There is still work to be done. But it's already clear that apes have some kind of understanding of language. 
how exactly it works still has to be researched. On the way back to the camp, the scientists experience something far more dramatic than any of their experiments. The chimpanzees have discovered a colibus monkey in the treetops. They prey on these little primates. Even the field researchers who are here every day seldom witness this kind of hunting. The chimpanzees hunt down the colibus together and kill it. No easy task for a great ape. The colobus defends itself. They're dangerous, especially the males. They can attack. A chimpanzee can fall, get bitten. They have to know a lot. I think the less experienced animals probably watch the experienced ones and learn from them. A second colobus monkey in the undergrowth is injured. The chimpanzee baby is interested but frightened to approach it alone. This is closer to Sigur. The night is on the left. Where? Who's doing that? Z. An experienced female finishes off the monkey. The baby chimp watches closely and learns. I think Cora just killed it. Nambi arriving. Was it Nambi? Nambi. Nambi has arrived and there's someone else running. Another aspect of the chimpanzee's behavior interests the researchers. The hunting of the colobus monkey appears to mean a kind of cultural revolution in the Bodongo forest. For more than 10 years, there was hardly any hunting activity here. Now and then, the chimpanzees hunted opportunistically. They caught a monkey when it was stupid enough to approach. But there wasn't any coordinated, active hunting. And then we discovered, when this new alpha male took over, there was a big difference in the structure. They suddenly started to hunt cooperatively. So it's a new behavioral pattern. And if you apply the common definition of culture, you could say it's a kind of cultural change. The personality structure of a single chimpanzee can apparently influence the development of an entire group. Further evidence of culture? In Germany, the psychologist Jana Uhr from Berlin's Free University is studying the great apes with her colleague Jenny Collard at Berlin Zoo. They have been investigating the animal's individual personality structures for some years. Currently, they are studying a group of five chimpanzees at the zoo. Together with her team, Jana Uhr has developed a new methodological approach to measure, classify and empirically compare behavioral patterns. The researchers spend up to six hours a day at the zoo observing each animal and its interaction with others continuously for 20 minutes. Every reaction, every movement, every approach. We observe the apes every day, four weeks at a time, 
and a variety of behavioral aspects that we've compiled systematically from research publications to provide the most complete picture possible. We observe how each individual relates to the others in its group, and then we analyze how the individuals differ from each other in their behavior. We make long-term analyses that don't just reflect specific fluctuations during the day. We focus on various behavioral areas and compare individuals. For instance, Soko, whose physical activities are more pronounced than those of the other chimpanzees. She runs around more. She's more active than the others. She's also less aggressive than the average chimpanzee we've observed. We take the many varied behavioral patterns that an individual displays and compare each individual with the others in a population to see how that individual is different from the rest. Jana Uwe doesn't simply rely on her own observations. She also takes account of what the keepers notice. They care for the animals every day. Specially developed software records each individual animal, and the keepers fill in detailed questionnaires. The result is a profile like Lily's. Jana Uhr has compiled nearly 270 of these profiles with data from 25 zoos so far. One of her preliminary conclusions, each individual personality can be significant for the development of a group, even for an entire species. There are various ways in which a chimpanzee can deal with a termite mound to get to particular food. And the differences are not part of their nature, which shows that they must be techniques which one of them invented. Otherwise, all individuals would do it naturally. And that's the point. Maybe some individuals were especially inventive, perhaps less wary of inspecting an unknown object, and discovered that it made an excellent lunch. So we can safely assume that it was these differences that played a vital role. Behavioral patterns specific to the individual leading to the development of culture. In this respect, chimpanzees are similar to humans. I think the fact that chimpanzees are different from one from another is really very important. And I've watched infants, and usually it's infants because their behavior is very flexible, you know. And they're always playing and they're poking around and investigating things. And I've seen an infant perform some behavior which could theoretically turn into a new kind of tool use. And because they're all different and some are more um, investigate more, you know, persistently than others, it's this kind of difference between individuals where you'll get one infant suddenly discovering a, a new kind of tool use. But how is this knowledge, this new culture, passed on from one generation to the next? Is it active learning, as in humans? Or is it simply imitation? Is this the fundamental difference between humans and chimpanzees? The main difference between human culture and great ape culture is that in humans, the transmission process is much more faithful. What the child is getting is much more similar to what the adult uh, is doing and wants them to learn. And because the adults are actively teaching it and making sure the children learn what they want them to, and the children are not just picking up useful information, they're conforming to what the adults want them to learn. Michael Tomasello bases his thesis on research with great apes living in captivity. But in the wild, Christoph Bursch has observed a very different phenomenon. It's very difficult to study the precise mechanisms of social learning in the wild. But what we see very clearly is that the baby apes are very keen to watch their mother and imitate what she does. They spend a great deal of time doing that. 
We've also observed that the mother actively stimulates her child to crack nuts by presenting it with half-cracked nuts or whole nuts that have to be cracked. She tailors this exactly to the child's capabilities. And the stimulus she provides depends on the child's age. It's fascinating to see that exactly the same behavior occurs in humans. And Christoph Bursch has gone a step further. He wanted to discover how old this tradition of nutcracking is. To answer this question, he set up an interdisciplinary team. Together with archaeologists in West Africa, he searched for traces of chimpanzees in the past. Here you see me taking part in excavations we made in Thai National Park to discover how long, for how many generations, chimpanzees have cracked nuts. One problem we encountered is that not just chimpanzees, but also humans use the forest. Initially, we uncovered a human layer from the Stone Age. Underneath this layer, we discovered another layer with stones. We were able to prove that these were indeed stones used by chimpanzees 4,000 years ago. That's the equivalent of 220 chimpanzee generations. So chimpanzee culture also has a history. Back to Uganda. In Budongo, the decisive experiment is being prepared. Klaus Zuberbühle and Thibaut Gruber are hoping to find the final piece of the jigsaw. They want to prove that chimpanzees learn socially. This time the experiment is more complicated. Zuberbühle and Gruber are searching for Knight, the daughter of the top-ranking female Nambi. They think she's very bright. The researchers hope to make her fish for honey with a stick instead of a sponge, and then see if she passes on this knowledge to the others. We want to isolate a particular animal so that the others don't learn the technique at the same time. With this kind of experiment, it's especially important that only the selected animal, in this case Knight, is separated from the group. That way we only enable her to learn the new technique. When she's finally mastered the technique, we'll repeat the experiment, but this time in a social context, so that the other animals can observe her using the new technique. If the others had already learned the technique, the experiment would, of course, be useless. Will Knight lay the foundation for a new cultural form among the Budongo chimpanzees with her idea? If so, the researchers would have proved in the wild that culture is acquired socially. have to proceed very cautiously. The apes mustn't be able to see them setting up the experiment. Once again, a tree trunk is filled with honey. The difference this time is that the researchers also supply the new technique. A poking stick is thrust into the hole to give Knight the right idea. If she uses the stick, her mother, the head of the clan, Numbi, will probably pass on this knowledge to the other members of the group. The others usually follow the high-ranking animals. For the scientists, the decisive moment is approaching. Knight has discovered the trunk with the honey. (laughs) 
However, she doesn't recognize the purpose of the stick. She licks the honey off it and throws it away. Initially, the experiment has failed, but the researchers don't give up. They'll be patient for another few weeks. If we get a positive result with this experiment, we'll help answer the question of whether animals have culture. There are still critics, even among our colleagues, who strongly criticize the chimpanzee culture theory and accuse us of not having any conclusive evidence that these behavioral differences we observe can be interpreted as culture. If we can show in the wild that the animals learn artificially introduced behavior socially from one another and then apply it afterwards, we'll close this gap and finally end the debate. Research into the culture of the great apes is still in the early stages. But with each new detail that emerges, the chimpanzee appears to get closer to us. However, it depends on humans whether our closest relatives will survive in a secure environment.